Welcome everybody to a new episode of Flower Circus Talks. Today we're going we're going to the UK. We've got a very special person today. We've got uh, Ostomeria Ben, and a fourth generation uh, Ostomeria grower. So uh, yeah, let's quickly get him into the live stream because this man has a great story to tell and uh, yeah, a big promoter of the the UK flower business. So uh, let's quickly uh, get him into the live stream. Hi guys. Hi John. Nice to see you. And nice to see you too. How are you, Ben? I'm good. As I said, when we were warming up to this event, I just love your threads. I love your get up. I love your, your hat and, and, and your clothes. You're just rocking it. I love it. Yeah, thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> and I can awesome. see in your stories today, you like rock as well a lot. <laughs> nice to meet you as yeah, well in the rock I, music as well. <laughs> so my favorite band, uh, my favorite band called Reef, uh, they were live on the radio in the UK because they've just released a new album. And obviously with the pandemic they haven't been able to do any live gigs so here in the uk uh, we're all getting a little bit stoked a bit excited about actually going to see live music so it's one of my passions music so to go now and get out and about to see music is going to be awesome yeah yeah i mean it, it's great and uh, and yeah i like circus and i uh, got it into the flower business uh, connected you are uh, yeah, promoting the, the UK flowers and your own flowers, uh, British flowers rock. So I think uh, you got those two things together there as well. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. To start for the people from outside the UK, can you tell a little bit about uh, more about yourself, the company, what you do? Yeah. So I'm a fourth generation grower here at Crosslands Flower Nursery. Uh, we've been going and growing since 1936. Uh, wow. in, in, in the 1930s here in the UK, uh, there was the Great Depression, high unemployment, a lot of people out of work. My great grandparents took the UK government up on a scheme which was to set up over 20 areas around the UK where unemployed families would go and work and farm the land. And my great grandparents were originals, one of the original families to sign up to this government scheme. And uh, yeah, they started growing as part of the Land Settlement Association. So people can google it uh, lsa and lsa siddlesham because siddlesham was the largest one of these 20 areas and that's yeah. where my great grandparents were and there was about 140 150 market gardens set up about three or four acres each and uh, then my granddad joined them after being a desert rat in world war ii he had my, my dad, uncles and aunties uh, on the LSA, this um, colony where they used to grow, uh, obviously, lo a lot of crops. And yeah. then we moved here to Warburton near Brighton on the south coast of the UK in 1957. So a really brief history. We've been going since 1936 and uh, we've been based here since 57, uh, where I live live today taking on over my mum, dad, uncles and aunties. So, yeah. OK, wow, great. I mean, the real family business with a big history as well. And yeah, I mean, um, we've, we've gone through a lot, you know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's, um, it's very rare in farming, but even rarer in the cut flower trade that we, we still exist and survive here in the UK. Yeah, there's not, not many people like me left here. So um, we're, we're proud what we do, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, the, the, the last, let's say, 20 years, a lot of things happened in the UK uh, yeah, uh, grower business. I mean, a lot of them disappeared, unfortunately. Uh, but you are still there and, and uh, it looks like you're thriving as well, uh, finding new ways to sell uh, flowers, uh, promoting yourself really well. So uh, actually, I want to know all about that part. OK, yeah, I mean, the, the big thing that uh, viewers and uh, listeners need to know is that based here in the UK, um, over 90 percent of our cut flowers in the UK are now imported. Um, that's not just obviously from Holland, but we obviously it's from uh, Kenya, Ecuador, Cambodia, Colombia. Um, so things are going from those countries into your Dutch auctions and back out again to the UK. Cheaper yeah. than maybe, I think even some of the Dutch growers can can grow it so it's not just a uk problem with cheap imported products it's also um in holland and i've also been speaking to people in america uh, california used to be a big flower hub a big flower grower hub but they're being killed off with the cheap colombian stuff from the south so it's not just a uk problem uh, other cut countries have had it as well um but yeah um about 90 percent of cut flowers in the uk 
are now imported. And obviously the carbon footprint and environmental impacts of that are radonculous. So it's all yeah. about British, British flowers rock or local flowers rock and trying to get people into more ethical, sustainable blooms. And here in the UK, we call it grown and not flown blooms. So uh, there you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was a period that, that uh, the, the supermarkets uh, were supporting, or it looked like they were supporting the, the, the local grown flowers. First, uh, they almost killed everybody, and then they thought, okay, we, we just have a few left, so we need to be careful with them. But it looks yeah, like so it's, it's changing again. So uh, we used to supply all the supermarkets. So any supermarket you can think of based in the UK, uh, we used to supply them. And one by one, they left us for the cheap inferior uh, sort of imported product and um, the last supermarket we were supplying uh, they just phoned me up on valentine's day 2020 and they said ben we don't want your flowers anymore because we can get them 4p cheaper a bunch from colombia and if you went to the top of their twitter page uh, it said that they wanted to be carbon neutral by 2030 it's a load of old baloney a load of old greenwashing and uh, people have to be careful um, luckily we now do supply morrison's supermarket yeah, yeah supplying them for two years and touch wood uh, they've been very ethical very sustainable and i think they have a target where they want um 30 of their flowers that they sell in their supermarket to be british so the future with Correct. morrison seems to be uh, very good uh, but also uh, when i when i was a young whippersnapper i'd be in the shed making hundreds of flower boxes and we used to send hundreds of boxes a week to uh, covent garden spitalfields Western International, the big London flower markets. And we also used to send up to Birmingham, Leicester, Sheffield, the Midland markets as well. Uh, now we do zero boxes, zero boxes a week um, to what you call the market um, yeah. because um, it's just unsustainable. Uh, I live very close to Brighton market. So we do about 20 odd boxes a week to them, but no longer do we really supply wholesale market because it's unsustainable. Uh, Granddad used to get 195 a bunch in the 60s and 70s. Now, if I send a bunch up there, they give me 50p. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> and my costs have obviously gone up as well. So um, we've had to diversify. So we sell direct to the public. We sell direct to florists, cafes and restaurants that have a sustainable food menu. They also want to be sustainable where the flowers come from on their table as well. Uh, yeah. We also supply farm shops and Basically, we supply people that want traceability and they care about the planet and where their produce comes from. Yeah, yeah. I've got a question from one of the viewers, uh, Morgan Douglas. Not he's uh, saying we also have a distrib distribution problem in the UK. Uh, it's hard to get British stuff, but we love uh, we love it when we can get them in. Yeah, so um, I get my flowers out very easily. It's picked and it's packed, and it's with the person the next day. Um, okay. Obviously, you've got my contact details and we'll say that at the end. Um, but you can find me, as I say, on all social media. Just message me. We don't have a website because I can't afford a website, but I get a lot of um, business and contacts through social media. Um, yeah. So it's Crosslands Flower Nursery on Facebook and Ulstrom Area Ben on Twitter and Instagram. So whoever's asking the question, if they want my flowers, just hit me up and they're with you the next day. Very, very easy. Yeah. Okay, Morgan. So uh, tomorrow you've got some nice Ostomerias in, in both your shops. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, just contact me on social media. And uh, we do about, we must do over 100 boxes a week now, direct to um, people's homes, florists, even florists that work from home. Um, so a lot of florists in the UK, they work out of studios. Um, so I deliver to their homes. So yeah, it's very easy. And the good thing about Ostromeria, the crop growing behind me here, is that it's... Um, very sustainable in the fact that it doesn't need to go in chillers in water as it goes around the UK. It's very happy in a reusable, recyclable box out of water uh, for even up to two days, even in the summer. The flower will just come back as soon as it goes into water. So it's a, yeah. a good, sustainable crop. Uh, it's good for transport in, in the UK. So it doesn't have to go in, in chillers or frozen vans or anything like that. It's very happy in, the, in a normal courier. So um, it works really well. Yeah, and, and it's just a short period of transport. So I think uh, sometimes we just want to cool the flowers all the time. And, and But when the transport is just a couple of hours, I mean, yeah. it shouldn't be a problem at and, all. And, and my flowers, it just goes overnight as well. So it's picked, packed, it goes overnight, and then it's with the customer the next day. And uh, yeah, people love it. Yeah, yeah it's great. Yeah. You know, um, they love it even when there's a bit of dirt or mud on the bottom of the stem. And they just love the fact that it was literally in the ground 
less than 12 hours before they receive it. It's fresh as fresh, you know, so um, it's really cool. Yeah, and I mean, the way you pick it as well is a bit different, especially than the Dutch. I mean, uh, yeah, they pick them well, they, in Holland, they pick them so Dutch, green. But yeah, so um, the big thing about Ulstromeria or any type of food or flower, you want to be harvesting your crop at a ripe bud stage. It's a bit like if you go strawberry picking, you want yep. those nice big fat red bits of fruit or you're picking your homegrown tomatoes and you want those nice big fat juicy red tomatoes it's the same here we're looking for those nice big fat ripe elongated buds not those bullet shaped things so if i can just i'm going to flip the camera really quickly and i'll just show you give you a little demo take a while to flip it yeah there it is there you go so basically you can see these buds here they're nice big fat and elongated so this is how we harvest them this will produce a bigger more vibrant flower head people think all stromera tiny little faded out butterfly heads well they will be if they're picked too tight so we harvest them like this um, but in other countries they'll harvest them they'll harvest them like this which are yeah. really, really tiny green buds. And basically people think if you pick that, it's going to last longer. Well, no, it's not. If, if you pick that or you pick that, they're going to last just the same. And actually this will open out into a bigger, more vibrant flower head. So, uh, yeah, that's the big difference with ours is that we harvest them at what we call a ripe, ready to go bud stage. Yeah. And the color will be probably more intense as well if you cut it in that stage. Exactly. You're getting a bigger, fresher, more vibrant flower head. It's, if basically you pick a red flower too tight in bud, it will struggle to open. And as it struggles to open, it will be like a faded orange. It will lose its natural color. So you want to leave it in the beds on the plant for as long as you can to really get that true natural color. And it will produce um, produce a really nice uh, vibrant color or a pale color or whatever it was so the one i just showed you was white for example but yeah. um yeah it won't it won't come out all all weird and fuzzy looking it'll be uh, a nice nice clean smooth petals as it opens and uh, and they'll open naturally so obviously some flowers they take about five weeks to come into the uk if they're coming from further afield so when we used to deal with some of the supermarkets they wanted a five week forecast because they were dealing in weeks so yeah. flowers would basically be a bit like Han Solo in Jabba's Palace in Star Wars, sort of cryogenically frozen in time as they're pumped full of chemicals and all of that. And then by the time you get them out into your floristry shop or into your home, the buds, they kind of go blur. They kind of don't really yeah. do anything because they're stressed out. Um, so whereas with ours, they're harvested and uh, they open what we call naturally. Um, we, we don't store. We store them here for a maximum maybe of two days before they're thrown away or they have a home because we want the customers to have the best freshest flowers possible yeah 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 i mean all the transport is just stress for the flowers so you see how they will open up it, it's it's stressful so they don't fully open up and that's that's a real yeah. pity uh yeah, and with, with the chemicals the big thing is like roses won't have any scent any smell because they're doused in chemicals and they'll kind of stay um brown and closed and some of the big lilies They'll go like big brown bananas where they don't open up properly. And, and the Ulstromeri, you'll see them tiny little faded out weird things. It's because they're harvested too tight, stored for too long at too colder temperatures. And um, yeah, they're just not fresh, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's really. Uh, Caroline Marshall Foster is in as well. And she's asking, hi, Ben. Good oh, to see you. Uh, good to see you, Caroline. I know Caroline. Well, I, I've never met her in person, but uh, we talk online or emails and stuff. I know her. Yeah. Awesome yeah. lady. She really is. Uh, she's asking, is there a price difference for uh, trade buyers? So you're you're selling uh, yeah, to consumers, but also to, to florists. Is there a price difference? Yes, because obviously the public, uh, we do a public box to their home for £20, which is four big bunches, including delivery. And then to florists, obviously, uh, the minimum order is 15 bunches, which is nothing for a florist to use. And obviously, yeah, florists get them. At, uh, cheaper prices because they're buying they're buying more quantity um yeah. so we have we have a public box of 20 pounds and then the florists they um they can choose what color they want and um how many they want as long as it's yeah 15 bunches um i think the cheapest the posy grade is 33 pounds a box um 
with VAT delivery for 15 bunches and we do a premium. The premium one is £42 for 15 bunches, including VAT and delivery as well. So they're the minimum. So that's not, yeah. not a lot of money really for a florist to, to use them up. No, and, and to have a great quality, I mean, uh, and fresh flowers as well. And, and you're selling yeah. by color or you're selling by variety? Uh, well, obviously, we specialize in the uh, Ulstrom area. Uh, we do a plethora, a smorgasbord of, of colors. Uh, we do over 70 varieties, uh, I think wow. 79. And we make sure we have a full color range available all year round. So um, florists, they just order by color. So if I've got five reds, there's surely one of them in the winter or the summer that's going to be ready so uh florists they just order by color and um yeah it works really well so it's it's my job to make sure i have uh as many colors all year round so the only colors we don't do are blue and black but all the other colors we've we've got covered <laughs> yeah <laughs> all the natural colors <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah uh caroline saying sounds good and with uh, the all-important british flag i mean you have to support local. I mean, and I think uh, during the pandemic, people were more into uh, supporting local as well, your local florist, local butcher, but also, yeah, don't forget your local grower. Yeah, and that's um, what I talk about in the British Flowers Rock Talks is that you've got to treat florists uh, as part of the community, just like you do with butchers, fishmongers, bakers. Um, where I live, we're losing a lot and lot of florists and people have to use florists and urge florists to buy local. So we've got a nice little harmony going where the grower, the florist and the consumer are in this nice little um, nice little community. Um, and, and that's what's been working really well. Obviously, I live near Brighton and uh, we only used to supply five boxes a week. Now we supply uh, over 20 boxes a week easily uh, where local people have, uh, have, are now going into their local florists and asking their local florists to support growers like me. So it can work, but here in the UK, it needs someone bigger and better than me to get that, to get that momentum going quicker because uh, I've been doing what I do now since, um, well, I did marine biology from 2000 to 2011 yeah and then i came back to the flower ranch here in 2011 and between 2011 and 2014 i tried to get help on this subject uh via um the flower industry via the national farmers union i'm a member of the nfu national farmers union i even had my local mp come out and i also tried to get help from government from from defra and no one wanted to help me so in 2014 sort of born through frustration really i started my british flowers rock campaign and yeah. people are still booking me up for talks in 2022. So um, it's a campaign that's just keeps going and going and I'll just keep doing it until it stops. So yeah. <laughs> now, hopefully it doesn't stop. I mean, uh, uh -huh. it's great what you're doing. Um, yeah, buying local, uh, seeing where it comes from, uh, carbon footprint, all those things are really important now. Uh, I mean, also, uh, the the anti um what is it uh, flower foam organization is quite big as well because uh yeah. it's a chemical process that, as well that's where my mind just goes it gets bamboozled so a, a florist for example she won't use any floral foam but then she'll use foreign flowers so the carbon footprint she, she the carbon footprint she saved with the packaging she's now just wasting with the imported flowers so it's if you can use a product if, if the flower you're using is british or local um you're already say help saving the planet so my mind just gets bamboozled when florists are like oh look i've done it with wire and no foam yeah but you're using foreign ulstromeria you could have saved even you know it, it, the mind yeah. just is it's just mad isn't it but um yeah so the, it has come a long way but uh, obviously we've still got a lot more where um florists and the flower industry can can save i mean plastic packaging um yeah. for example ulstromeria uh, when it comes in those primary buds of ulstromeria uh, they have like netting on them and you've got all the cable ties and the packaging um a lot of florists that have my flowers locally they have the raw product so they don't have any packaging at all because even if my bad boys sussex slammers as they call them here were wrapped in paper paper <laughs> is still trees and a lot of forestry paper yep. would never buy a degrade in my lifetime so the best way you can buy any product is package free and luckily um florists and the public around here they literally just have the flowers they don't they don't have any packaging if they're not going to use it so um and uh, the sleeves that i use are made out of recycled plastic 
and they are recyclable. And um, at the back of my wholesaler, uh, he gives me all the empty boxes of all the foreign flowers. Uh, so I use all of those empty boxes and they're the boxes I send out to go to the public. So uh, sometimes the public will phone me up and go, oh, Ben, this box says Ecuador on it or Cambodia. I'm like, yeah, I know. It was just I'm just using it. I'm just, and they're like, oh, that's a great idea, Ben. Keep using the, the empty boxes. So I say a lot of our packaging is um, is packaging that I just get for free. Uh, that's only going to be in the bin at the wholesaler. And uh, if we get a delivery of fertilizer or a delivery on the nursery and it's wrapped in plastic and cardboard, I save all of that and I use that in my packaging. So, um, yeah, it's all all those little things all add up. So Yeah, yeah it really does. But uh, still there's the uh, misconception, I think, with, with uh, what's happening in the greenhouse as well. I mean... How much water are you using? How much or, or how much or are you using chemicals at all in your greenhouse? That's still something that's in people's minds. But take us through what's happening in the greenhouse for from a young plant to or the whole life cycle. Yeah, no, that's really good. So basically, um, when my granddad moved here in 57, it was very much a continuation of what my great grandparents were doing on that land settlement association, growing a real diverse range of crops. And we'd had a menagerie of chickens, ducks, cattle, sheep, uh, growing flowers and salad crops. And then the birth of the supermarkets, obviously, in the 60s and 70s, people got used to having the cheap products all year round. So like strawberries and blueberries in December and, and all of that rubbish, you know. Um, so no longer could we grow lots of different things at Crosslands. It was time to specialize. And Granddad tried a lot of things like tomatoes and freesias and croissants. But we arrived at the Ulstrom area because it's a very sustainable crop to grow in the UK naturally. So yeah. in the UK, Ulstrom area is known as a dry crop. So by a dry crop, it doesn't like it's G&Ts or rum and cokes or alcohol. But what we mean by a dry crop is that we only water for 20 minutes once a month in the winter. So we only do about three or four waterings between October and March. Wow. And then uh, we only water in the summer uh, 20 minutes once every 10 days. So it's a very dry crop, which is good. Uh, also, uh, we, we have hundreds of these beds you can see behind me. So we've got hundreds and hundreds of rows and the beds are about a meter wide by 30 meters long. We've got hundreds of those beds. But um, this year, for example, we're only replanting three of them. So we replace wow. less than 5% of the crop a year. A lot of our plants are over 20, 30 years old, still producing good saleable stems for the people at home and in the shops because um, it's a sustainable crop. You know, we don't have to come in, in here, uh, use st sterilize 100 percent of the soil, get all the old plant material out. As I say, we've been doing it for so long. We're specialists. We know what varieties cope best with the British weather. So, yeah, it's only less than 5% replanting a year. So we don't use any peat anymore. We're peat free and we use very little sterilization. Um, also, it's known as a dry crop, but it's also known here in the UK as a cool crop. So yeah. it looks cool and rad in your arrangements, in your bouquets and things like that. But by a cool crop, we mean it doesn't take a lot of heat in the winter to get good production. So if we were growing tomatoes or other types of crops in these greenhouses, we need about 20 degrees of a winter's night but the optimum temperature for the British Ulstrom area is only 13 degrees so we can be a lot more frugal with the heating yeah. and when we are heating we're using the little wooden pellets so I've got some here to show you so we're not burning oil or anything anymore um, we're surrounded by um, Goodwood and Slindon estates and they have a lot of woodland uh, that needs to be managed and all of that managed wood goes into these little pellets which I'll just flip flop the camera and the magic. Yep, there it is. <laughs> there it is. Okay. So these, these are wooden pellets. And um, we burn about 100 tons of these a winter, which is nothing compared to chicken farms or Buckingham Palace has the biomass. Um, and a lot of farmers need a lot more heat. But when we do need heat, um, we're now burning these sustainable local wooden pellets and we're not burning uh, oil anymore which is which is really good um so yeah that's what they look like and they go into a big boiler and that basically heats the pipe work so if i show you quickly um so this is a bed so we've got a meter wide bed 30 meters long and you can see this is our heating pipe a flow and return yeah. around the bottom beds because 
whenever you're heating anything, you want the heat to be down by your root system, keeping a nice dry atmosphere down by the root system. And as the heat radiates off this pipe in the winter, you're clearing off all the condensation and dampness that builds up on the plants. And then you can see we've got our low level irrigation, the gray pipe running through the bed yeah, yeah. and over the top. We've also got overhead irrigation as well and all the crop supports and the netting to keep it all tucked and trained into the bed. But um, yeah, it just gives you a bit of a, a bit of an idea, really. So, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, so, it's um, unbelievable. So that's really, yeah, it naturally is very sustainable. So uh, not a lot of water, not a lot of replanting, not a lot of heat. And when we do need heat, it's, um, it's local sustainable biomass now. Um, you asked about pests and diseases. We don't use any pesticides or insecticides anymore. It's all about biocontrol. So we're basically uh, inserting biology in the greenhouse that's going to kill yeah. off biology that we don't want, basically. So I've got um, <clears throat> a couple of examples for you guys. So you may have seen these byline cards. It's really yep. tricky on my uh, Yeah, it's the other way around. <laughs> yeah, it's really tricky. There you go. So these byline cards, so this is in Carsia, and where my thumb is, there's a little, um, where my finger is, there's a little circle, and these come in the post, and basically in Carsia, they're like mini wasps, and you hang these cards up on the netting of the Ulstrom area, and the mini wasps will lay eggs in whitefly eggs, so you'll, you'll kill off the, all the whitefly, because these, these bad boys will go and hunt them down, basically. And the, you can use these for, with banker plants as well, so you can hang these up yep. around aubergine plants, eggplants, tomato plants, and you can basically create uh, Venus fly traps for your whitefly, so you can create a good population of these mini wasps, the Incarsia, and um, yeah, no, no need for any chemicals when you've got those around. Um, also, we get a lot of spider mite in the yeah. mid to late summer, and we use phytoselis. So this is a vial, an empty vial, uh, but you get 2,000 phytoselis. These guys are a different type of mite. They're about twice the size of the spider mite. Sprinkle these over our crop, and um, these guys will hunt down and gorge and feast themselves on the spider mite. So again, you're using biology to kill off other biology, and a really easy hack for any gardening on a small scale, large scale, yeah. is use the yellow sticky traps. Um, <laughs> yep. So I've got I've got one set up here to show you guys. Um, just, just the yellow sticky tra traps. So they're, they're very sticky. And we mainly use those sticky traps for leaf hopper. So um, between the end, end of March and Christmas, so between end of March and Christmas, we're in here harvesting seven days a week. We're busy. But then between Christmas and Valentine's Day, we harvest the crop three days a week. So the, the plants are sat here for a bit longer and they get signs of, um, of leaf hopper. And leaf yeah. hopper are like the vampire of the gardening world. They suck out the goodness of your leaf. And that's when we use those yellow sticky traps to basically the leaf hopper adults. They stick onto the trap and you stop the life cycle. So, again, no need for any chemicals. Yeah. I mean, it's great and, and no need for any chemicals. It means that uh, the plant uh, thrives more as well. I mean, it, the plant, uh, it doesn't matter which chemical you spray, it will not like it as well. It will not grow as good as it should in a normal environment and in a good yeah. environment. Look, look how nice and green and lush they look. We're in July, you know, I mean, some nurseries I go to and their plants are all like, it's like a desert in their greenhouses, you know. But yeah. it's, uh, it's thriving here. And we, we also, we don't use any chemicals on our weeds. All of our weeding is done by our hands. So nice and muddy hands today because I've been, been okay. weeding. Yeah. yeah, and also the, the goodness of that weed, once you've pulled out the root of the weeds and lay it on top of the soil, all of that goodness goes back into the soil and it's really good for the plants as well. And um, we also say we're peat free now. Uh, we've been doing a compost program for the last few years. So we get about 20 tons of organic compost delivered yeah. uh, once every two years. And that also really helps the soil um, soil as well. But but granddad picked a good spot. You know, we're not clay. We're not sand. We've got a nice medium loam uh, soil. So we're we're on the south coast of the UK. It's perfect growing. We're the perfect soil. Um, we're very lucky. Yeah. Granddad did a good job. Yeah. I mean, I was actually surprised that you said you had varieties that are over 20 to 30 years already in your greenhouse. 
I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not an osteomedia specialist, but I normally know that it's about seven to ten years and that people change their crops. Yeah, um, a lot of people, they come with a three year license initially and a lot of people, they replace them after three or four years. Yeah. Wow. But if you can, yeah, there, there's a little dip in quality, but it doesn't keep on diminishing the quality. If you look after it, you know, you keep the beds nice. I think healthy. that's. And um, also uh, we do a lot of thinning. You get a lot of blind growth which needs to come out as well. And so, and even if you break a stem, that broken stem needs to come out because it's wasting energy from the source. So it's all these things that we work hard on doing to maintain the quality and longevity of our, of our plants. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's just taking care of the plants that the root system is good. And, and then yeah, if you're good for the plant, the plant is good for you. Yeah, exactly. If you look after the plants, they'll look after me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's really great. I mean, uh, yeah, you're, you're doing obviously a very good job in the greenhouse, but also outside the greenhouse and, and, and showing people everything. I mean, you even won an award, the Empowering Communities Award. Uh, I mean, no, I don't, I don't know how we won a, an award in lockdown, but we did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and yeah, it's difficult to celebrate if you get an award during lockdown. <laughs> that's the problem. Well. It, it was weird because um, the award was done on Zoom and usually it's done, there's um, a big castle near me and it's usually this lavish pucker dinner that you go and so I missed out, like I, I missed out on all the all the jazz, you know, so, uh, but yeah, we won, we won the Grower Award in 2019, uh, we won the, the Sussex Gold Award in last year and um, Hampton Court, uh, we won a Silver Gilt Medal a few weeks ago as well okay congratulations so, um, so you know our, our cabinets get you know three awards in three years so you know it's pretty cool i guess yeah 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 i mean it really is and and getting out there and i think that's that's very important bringing getting out the, the message that you have and the great message that you have uh, throughout the country uh and it's so difficult to to reach people sometimes we all think it's very easy because we have facebook we have social media we've got instagram everything uh but now we can see it as well uh, with Morgan asking for how, how can you deliver them? And I always have problems with delivery of uh, UK grown flowers. Yeah, you shouldn't do it. it all, all UK grown flowers, it's very easy. You put them in a box, they go in a van and they're with you the next day. It's A to B. It's not like it's coming from Cambodia to Holland, Holland to Great Yarmouth, from Great Yarmouth to Covent Garden, from Covent Garden to a middleman, to a florist shop, to someone's friend, to a house. And they last, what, a week, five days? I mean, what a journey for something that's supposed to be fresh, romantic. That's why we yeah. have flowers to say sorry, thank you. We have them for weddings and events. Flowers shouldn't be, you know, draining on the environment and the planet. They should be fresh, romantic and um, and nice and easy. You shouldn't have to think too hard about where have they come from? What chemicals have they been used? What slave labor has been used to pick them or, or things like that? And the water usage in these other countries and things like that. So, um, yeah, a lot of people in the UK, um, the public, they, they don't know any of this. And uh, that's all that I aim to do is just to, to educate, make people aware and to support their local florists and to, to use as much British local flowers as they can. And then yeah. um, you know, it's trying to help the florists as well. So, um, yeah. But yeah, um, I... going back to the social media side, like when I first started my campaign, I was going to flower clubs, uh, women's institutes, and I still do. I do about 50 or 60 talks a year in front of real people. And uh, there's something to be said for, for getting your message out at a garden show or actually in front of people rather than uh, on social media. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we have such a beautiful product. People want to see it, want to smell it, want to, to buy it as well if they see it, because there's nobody who will leave without flowers probably if you do a talk. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I, I take I take the flowers with me. Um, and we also we do tours here as well. So we're not open to the public like a garden center, but uh, we have uh, some somewhere where it's a, a minimum of 10 people. It's just five pounds a head for two hours. And uh, we give people proper proper tours of the nursery um, to, you know, talk about everything we're speaking about and more. You know, they get to see the biomass boiler. They get to see uh, how we process, uh, how we harvest, how we pack. 
and they get to see the big cold stores and the chillers. And we take them to all the different areas of the nursery. And we talk about the big differences between what we're doing and what um, maybe other growers in other countries are doing. And by the end of the tour, they're like loving it, you know. So, um, yeah, yeah we, we do tours as well. And we're sold out for this year. And we're nearly sold out for next year already as well. Wow. Just love coming, on the, coming on the tours, yeah. Yeah, I think people want to, they, they love the story behind the flower and they want to meet the grower and, and what's happening. And that's also something for the florist. I mean, well, while they're making a bouquet, it, it will take 10 minutes. Maybe some floors are quicker. Maybe some of them, it takes a little bit longer. But what are you going to tell about when you're making the bouquet? I mean, you can tell great stories. Look, this is They are from Astomeria Ben, and it's just around the corner and you have a great story. And the nice thing is, People get a bouquet. It's a gift with a story as well. There's almost no other product with such a great story as flowers. Yeah, it's about that traceability. I go to my local fishmonger because I want to know it's line core, it's sustainable and it's fresh. I go to my local butcher because I want to get more sustainable cuts of meat that you can't find in a supermarket. Um, you know, I go to my local baker because I know he's baked it that night uh, and it's fresh in the morning. Um, it's exactly the same with florists you know and um you know people just have to use them more and in, in, encompass them in 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 the community more so um and uh hopefully that is hopefully that's helping i mean the city near me uh called chichester i think when i was a you know a grom a young kid i think there was over 10 florists and now there are no florists in chichester yeah. you know so um but brighton it still survives it's a bigger town bigger city um but um yeah, I know it's difficult for the florists because they always say, oh, they compete with the supermarket. But if they buy homegrown, they can obviously get a cheaper, a cheaper product. So we do a posy grade. So we talked about sustainability. Yeah. Um, in Holland, do you have something called the ugly wonky veg? Do you have wonky veg or ugly yeah. veg? Yeah, it's starting so, a little bit now. But here in the UK, we have a famous chef called Hugh Fernie Whittingstall. And he came up with a campaign called War on Waste. Unfortunately, the flowers were left out of the TV program, but I do a wonky, ugly flower bunch, uh, which is what we call our posy grade. So we do our premium grade and our yeah. posy grade. And I'll just show you now, show you guys what they look like. And uh, basically our posy grade, um, if I sell to a florist for one pound, she can sell it for three pounds, undercut the supermarket. And at the end of the day, it's just a nice bunch of flowers for someone to take home just like those parsnips or ugly veg are going to be put into roast dinners and soups. But um, this is what they they look like. So just wait a second. So this is our premium grade. So this is uh, Whistler, which is a lovely white variety. And yeah. our premium grade is five chunky stems, 90 centimetres tall for big, proper, expensive bouquets, floristry, pedestal arrangements and designs. And then next door this is my wonky ugly flower bunch the posy bunch so again it's whistler with a, a sprig of pink in um this is eight instead of five stems this is eight to ten stems these are 60 centimeters long and it's just a nice a nice bunch of flowers for someone to pick up outside a farm shop or a florist yeah. and um yeah they're um they all this bunch of flowers would be discarded by a supermarket or a wholesaler because the stems they're a little bit wonky you can see they're a bit gnarly they don't weigh 22.1 grams and all that nonsense but at the end of the day it's a nice fresh bunch of flowers that are going to last two or three weeks in someone's vase and also if a florist is doing a floral crown a buttonhole a little jam jar a little table decoration something that's 60 centimeters um, i now sell a lot of these to florists um, where they don't need the big thick stem length so again it's saving the planet and it's the war on waste so that's our posy grade and that's our premium grade so there you go but please don't call them ugly because they look good as well <laughs> yeah so i don't uh, i call them our posy grade so yeah. premium posy um but yeah it's uh, it's just getting on board with that war on waste the ugly wonky veg and the flower industry growers throw away tens and tens of millions of stems around the world every day uh, because they don't come up to supermarket specification. And it's radonculous, you know, because you're throwing yeah. away something you've put as much love, passion, 
fertilizer, watering, heating in as you have the other tall, chunky stems. So, again, it's, it's just that complete waste. So uh, we do throw away tens of thousands of stems a year, but we're now selling thousands of those posy bunches a week through British Flowers Rock, through the education, through awareness. And um, as I say, florists, you know, if they just think outside the box a little bit, uh, they can get a cheaper product and sell it for cheaper than the supermarket selling next door by using things like my wonky flowers, the posy grade. So it's, yeah. uh, it can be it can be done. <laughs> it's something actually we tell during our shows as well. It's it's uh, figure uh, figure of speech, thinking outside of the box, but also literally because all the flowers are delivered in a box. So as a florist, if you make something that doesn't fit in a box, you will automatically have something that a supermarket will never sell. Exactly. Exactly. And a lot of florists, they're looking for this country style look. They don't want a massive thick stem. Um, they want something to hang over a table, hang over a vase. And the wonky stems and the, the smaller stems, they're more malleable and uh, they actually fit better in some of the smaller um, table decorations when they're doing a woodland theme or um, like a gnarly theme or something like that. They're looking yeah. for something a bit different. Um, yeah, they can save the planet and their pennies and still have a nice... A nice decoration, a nice design. Yeah, I mean, that's great. And, and it's sometimes ridiculous. Uh, I had to supply some supermarkets as well. And if you see just the specifications, I mean, they uh, the length of the stem, if it's one centimeter too short, let's say it's 90, not 90, but 89. That's already yeah. a problem. Uh, grams, yeah. so how many grams is one stem? I've seen the most beautiful flowers, but they had small leaves. So there wasn't yeah. enough weight in the stem because the leaves were too small. So then we have yeah. had an ugly flower with really big leaves and that was good enough for the supermarket. I yeah, mean, that's that's the weird thing is that the supermarkets, they don't care about the freshness, the quality or anything of the actual flower. It's all to do with all these other specifications that someone on a computer has made up. Um, so all the supermarkets we've supplied only Morrisons have been out to my nursery to see it in its natural habitat. All the other supermarkets, it was just on email and very, they just sent out middlemen to us. They never actually cared about what we were doing, the British Flowers Rock thing, about the no pesticides. All they cared about is um, getting the best quality for the cheapest price they can. And yeah. uh, it's not right. It's not right. You know, um, the British public or even any, any other country, the public just need to be made aware because in the UK, we've had Jamie Oliver's, uh, the Jimmy's, the Hugh Fernley's. And uh, now our food uh, product placement has got better. Our food labeling has got better. And um, it's not because the supermarkets wanted to do that. It's because these chefs um, made us aware, made us educated. And we signed up in our millions to get rid of a lot of these bad food processes and methods and um, about the ugly wonky veg and all that. So I think if you give the British public or the Dutch public, you know, you give them some information, 90% uh, of the time people are going to make the right decision um, to, to buy to buy local and to support their heritage and their own people, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's unbelievable with, with the labeling as well in, in supermarkets. It doesn't say where it's from or it says it somewhere it's from. Yeah, it, it can be from three different continents. And yeah, <laughs> so you've, you've touched on something which in the British Flowers Rock campaign, I always bang on about. And that's product placement of flowers and labeling of flowers. So um, when we when we used to supply one particular supermarket in the 1980s, uh, they had a picture of my uncle on the label with a bit about crosslands and some good information. Uh, then in the 90s, they got rid of that and just put the union flag on. And then in the 2000s, they got rid of the union flag and they put grown in Colombia slash UK. Um, so when you walked and buying your Ulstrom area in this supermarket, the public had no idea. It might have sort of said grown on planet Earth. Yeah. Because it just said two countries on it. And all it was is because they couldn't be bothered to do two different labels and the ink and the money, basically. And, um, yeah, so um, it's it's really bad because take um, Easter. So we've had Easter here in the UK yeah. uh, a few months ago. And all it will say is Easter bouquet, 10 quid, 10 pounds. It won't say when the flowers were harvested, where the flowers were harvested, um, what chemicals are on the packaging because they um, put chemicals on the inside of the packaging to stop the buds opening in transit. They don't say what chemicals are on the flowers. No information apart from 
the name of the bouquet and the price. And you wouldn't get get away with that with even furniture now in the UK has to be said if it was made here or just erected here, you know, put yeah. up here. Um, so even furniture and even TV programs, when you see a David Attenborough program at the end, it will say the carbon footprint rating of how they made that TV show. But with flowers, there's no law, there's no, no anything. And it's just not good enough. It's not good enough. No, they, they try to keep it vague because it's uh, it's very difficult to say where did rose come from? Was it from uh, Kenya? Was it from Ecuador? Was it from Holland? Uh, UK? Well, it's not hard for the supermarkets to say, no, because they know exactly where, yeah. where they're coming from, but they just can't be, they want to save money on labeling and, and things like that. And my thing is product placement big time in the UK. So usually when we walk into a supermarket in the UK, the first thing people see is the big flower stand. Yeah. And a lot of the supermarkets above the flower stand, they say, oh, we support 100 percent British. We support local seasonal flowers. But actually, if you go around that stand, Egypt, Israel, Colombia, Holland, Cambodia, it's just you, you couldn't get away with that with food or any type of product. It's it's almost illegal. You you couldn't do that. And um, and that's what people have got. The the British public they're they're just. They have no good signage. So my idea would be to have um, a British seasonal flower stand and then have another flower stand with all the other bits on. You know, not not hard, not 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 hard to do. But um, no, not at the, long, all. the longer they can get away with not doing it, uh, they will. Because um, I said, unfortunately, with food, we've had the Jamie Olivers. But in the flower industry, we don't have anyone um anyone like that so all i can do is my my little bit and and make the change uh, where i can yeah yeah I, I think that's something people uh, everybody and you are uh, you're way too shy and then because you have a huge impact already and maybe for you it's not enough but with all people okay. doing this uh teaming up i mean we can complain about that supermarkets are not showing where it's from but i think it's a huge chance for the uh for the florists to, st to stand out of the crowd and say, okay, this is from this country, this is from this country, this is this, is this footprint, and, and if you want to have only a local bouquet, we can make the local bouquets. Uh, if you're looking for those big roses, okay, they are from Ecuador, but no, that they're from Ecuador. All those things. I mean, I think that now, uh, during the pandemic, there's a whole new generation, or the younger generation is uh, in love with flowers and plants again, but they want to know where they come from, what's happening. And if it says Easter bouquet, 10 pound, it doesn't say anything. But as a florist, you have the time to to educate the people as well. Yeah. And, and, and that's again that the florists that I supply, uh, they tag me, I tag them, we share, we learn together. And also if the florist has a question, she can ask me, you know, yeah. oh, why, why has that happened this week? Or, well, did you did you take the leaves off? Where were they stored? Oh, no airflow. They were stored somewhere very hot and humid and or, or you know, anything like that. Any problems we can iron out and things like that. And I can tell yeah. them the, the science behind it. And, 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 and florists, you just wouldn't get that with a wholesaler. You know, you just get a refund or maybe not even that or something. So also when a florist works with the grower, um, you know, you support each other, you learn off of each other. Yeah. Um, so I do a lot of market research. So when granddad and dad were running the show here, um, everyone wanted red for Valentine's Day and red for Christmas. Now everyone wants white for Valentine's Day and white for Christmas. So you phase out a bit of the red and you have more white. So you, you also learn as a grower, you listen and learn and um, work with the florists as well to, to, to grow colors that they want. So um, it's a nice little, um, I say it's a nice little community really. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, if more florists get on board with it, um, they, as you say, they can think outside the box and and say, you know, we're selling all Air Ben's flowers and, and all of that and all the sustainability stuff they're doing. And, you know, at the end of the day, they're getting they're getting more bang for their buck because not only are they buying the flowers, but they're buying the traceability and the story behind it as well. So um, yeah. it, it's more romantic again. So it's good. Yeah. It really is. And I think, uh, yeah, directly from a grower to a flower shop, uh, like you said, there are so many middlemen in, in, in the normal uh, uh, chain that they can, so many things can go wrong. And not, not only that, it's also you learn from the florists as well. They say, OK, uh, you already know red for Valentine's Day. They prefer white already. 
that's something probably a normal grower on the other side of the world will know in 10 years maybe <laughs> yeah 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 it's it's just a better it's just a better way of sort of working with people because we're all we're all humans we're all different just like all these varieties are different and um people have their own own methods and things but i think the best way is to try and just learn as much as we can off of each other and have more sort of transparency you know like i'm yeah. doing this this thing with you today and i i do loads of these things just to uh, get the message out there a bit more and stay open because even in the uk a lot of farms and uh, flower growers on the outside it says keep out private land but no i want to let people in i want to i want to share i want to because that's the only way we're going to make change is to yeah. educate make people aware and to to get out and about you know that's what we saw in the in the in the in the bulb district in Holland with the beautiful fields in in springtime and it was they tried to keep everybody out but people were out of control they just want to <laughs> wanted to run in and then some of the, the 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 growers' wives started to think okay why don't we make just a field so people can take pictures and let's open a small cafe or something so they can have a drink and a chat and and uh, make a special photo zone with with all kind of things. And now they're popping up like mushrooms. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's a great yeah. business, and and it's yeah. People, people at the end of the day, people do want that traceability. They are, if they're allowed to be interested in something, they're going to be curious. You know, even if they learn a little, fa a few facts and things. So that's why we, that's why we do the tours. We do the organized tours to to yeah. let let people in and things in an organized fashion. Yeah. No. Yeah. Wendy Ria saying, really interesting, would love to chat. Uh, Wendy, you can reach uh, Ben on his uh, social media uh, channels. And that's, uh, let me get them in the screen as well. Uh, Ostomiria Ben, on, uh, that's on can I Can I type it in or can you type it in? It's, a, it's already in the screen. Oh, it's on the screen, yeah. Yeah, uh, so Ostomiria Ben. And on Facebook, it's Crosslands Flower Nursery. Yep. So then uh, yep. you can contact Ben. Yep. Twi Twitter and Instagram, it's at Ulstramaria Ben. And then, yeah, Crossland's Flower Nursery on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. You can just message me on any of those and I'll get back to you. That's that's good. That's the yeah. nice thing of social media nowadays. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's you know, as I say, I, I can't afford a website. And to be honest, I, I share, I'm always sharing information on social media and people enjoy it. And I'm busy, you know, I only sleep for four hours a day or whatever. <laughs> I'm busy, so to manage a website, it's just you know, it, it just I, takes I too much time, I think. Yeah, and as I say, it's um, the social media. If you, if you do it correctly, then um, if people want your flowers, they'll they'll ask for them on on that, and then you just give them your de your email and your phone number, and then that's how it goes. Yeah, so I mean, really, really great. Uh, out now as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm here today. Outside is very wet and windy, but sun's come out for a little so, bit. that's a little bit of uh, flower magic <laughs> yeah. yeah it's actually perfect growing weather at the moment it's it's not too hot not too cold and um the plants are loving it they're not you can see behind me they're lovely and lovely and green and they're going to get i'm over six foot they're going to get to about seven or eight foot tall through the winter wow uh, another sustainability thing we didn't mention is that up in the roof above me here i don't have any led or sodium artificial lighting so that's a good thing because we don't cause any light pollution. Um, but what we do get in the winter is very tall, tall growth. But um, yeah. yeah, no, no light pollution. So that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Caroline is saying um, and this awesome one, woman is struggling a bit to knock all imports on the head. Uh, workers in Kenya, etc., need the export markets to survive, eat, learn and have homes. Uh, there's a balance needed. Uh, I totally agree, Caroline. But I think you need to have uh, to get, give people uh, the chance to to choose as well. Once something is locally grown, like Ostomeria, give people the chance to buy locally. If you, if you can grow something of quality in your own country, you're just saving so much carbon and the planet. I mean, we're one of the larger nurseries left. We're only four acres. The farms in Kenya, they're 400 acres each. <laughs> I don't think they got to worry about someone like me. <laughs> Supermarkets deal in millions and millions of stems of flowers a week. There's no way someone like me would be able to produce that. Yeah. Um, but but all the time that we can produce it, something of quality, then there is room obviously for both both markets. But why should I have to throw stems away 
Um, but flowers take five weeks to go around the world. And, and that's another thing, fair trade. Our government will give, up, give other countries money, but they, we don't get any help anymore. We don't get any help for modernization of greenhouses or doing a proper campaign or it's all done off my own back. We don't get any government grants or anything anymore. So there's no yeah. like fair trade UK. It's I mentioned it's bamboozled. If our government want to lower our climate change and, and carbon footprint we've we have to invest a little bit in in our own farming in our own industries um so and things like with, with the pandemic and the ash cloud you know if we rely too heavily on on imported products and then we can't get them uh we're kind of stuffed because <laughs> we've relied yeah. so heavily on it so there there's a balance to be had and at the moment over 90 percent being imported i think that's a bit of an imbalance <laughs> but yeah so yeah we'll see yeah, you see it during the, the, the difficult periods, the, the, the uh, pandemic. Um, but also, I think a local go or the, the, the government can tell you, OK, you can't spray this or you can't use these chemicals. Uh, not that you're using any, but uh, once all the production is not in your country, you cannot ask anything because it's in another country. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't know what's going on in these other farms or whatever, I guess. No. No, so um, you know we're we're very um, transparent. We're very open about what we do here, and um, yeah, I guess because we're proud of what we're doing. Every every little step, every little bit of plastic or elastic band we're saving, or whatever, it's all you know. Um, yeah, and you should be proud. I mean, you're, you're doing a really great uh, job, uh, and Caroline is. Uh, now typing her answer, totally get and local will always uh, get my vote. Just wouldn't want to say that importers are all bad. Uh, as for government support, it's shameful that you uh, get nothing. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a shame because we, we we need some help to modernize our infrastructure, you know, our greenhouses and things. So uh, sort of a shoestring budget, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, uh, but you know, it keep, keeps me entertained, keeps me busy. So. Yeah, and keeps you creative as well. <laughs> it does. Always thinking outside that damn box. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, unbelievable. But yeah, well, really. An awesome chat anyway. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time and 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 uh, taking us through uh, the greenhouse, telling us about the Ostomerias, your great uh, product uh, or your great uh, project, uh, British Flowers Rocks. So uh, yeah, hopefully uh, next time when I'm in the UK, uh, we have the possibility to to see each other and. Uh, Definitely, definitely. And make sure you're wearing that hat and everything when you come to the UK as well. Don't worry. I, I, I only take the hat off when I go to sleep. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me on your amazing uh, Flower Circus series. It's It's been a real privilege and, and an honor, really, because you've, you've had some amazing guests. So I'm, I'm very lucky and fortunate to be to be on on here so thank you very much yeah and uh, i'm really happy that uh, i can add you as an amazing guest as well uh, we're uh, almost uh, up to 100 shows already so i'm uh, really proud of that that we uh, we came uh, this far uh, with such uh, great guests uh, next week actually we have uh, an online flower show so we're going to make uh, some really nice arrangements it's going to be with the belgian champion stefan van berlo so we're going to make some uh, beautiful arrangements uh, next week so uh, hope to see you all uh, next week Ben, thank you uh, very much again. I uh, hope to see you soon. And everybody, uh, please stay safe and, uh, and see you soon. Bye, guys. Bye.